Forrest Brazil is here with us live at DevOps Enterprise Summit from our Dev Interrupted Dome in the middle of the Expo Hall. Uh, so if you're watching on YouTube right now, you're going to see some really interesting backgrounds. People walk around us, kind of stare at us. Uh, and it's going to be a great episode because he's joining Dev Interrupted to talk about his incredible work as the cloud bard for Google uh, or his other title, the uh, head of developer media at Google Cloud. Uh, Forrest, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. Great to be here, Connor. Uh, I am really excited to hear, first of all, how did you get the title Cloud Bard? You know what? It's made up, but then aren't all titles made up? It, all so. words are technically. So like, yeah, I think you're doing great. There. Yeah, yeah. So I, I've uh, I've been doing things in the cloud community for a long time uh, to try to help developers understand concepts that may seem arcane. I, I, I come out of the um, kind of enterprise IT world. I've done most of the things I think you can do in, in enterprise IT. I've been a, a front end and back end developer. I was a SQL Server DBA for a while. Oh, wow. I've managed engineering teams at one point. I've been a consultant working with companies from uh, startups all the way up to the Fortune 50, kind of helping them figure out how to do uh, large cloud migrations and, and uh, build modern cloud apps. And uh, it, a lot of that was in the AWS ecosystem. I was one of the uh, AWS, one of the original AWS serverless heroes. Oh, so they poached which, you? Yeah, no, no, no. They, I was sort of an unpaid developer advocate is okay, the best okay. way I can describe their, their community hero program. Uh, but that was great. Got to, to meet and work with a lot of people, especially in the serverless uh, community. I spent a lot of time, used to help organize serverless conf, uh, dearly departed back in, in pre-pandemic days. Uh, and then at some point along the way, you know, I started, I, I, I like to draw cartoons to help people understand technical concepts. I, like I to, knew I needed to follow you on Twitter. Yeah, I, I like to sing songs. I'm actually singing a bunch of songs later today in my ah. talk at, at Does. We've got a big grand piano on stage. It's going to be, I that's hope. That's so it's, exciting. It, it's going to be weird, but, you know, it's that's that's kind of the whole that's thing the at this point. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So that's that's where the, the cloud bard thing comes from. And then about a year ago, uh, I uh, went over to Google Cloud uh, to kind of help them, you know, talk to developers and, and uh, help our developer community, our operator community, especially uh, understand uh, what is this Google Cloud thing? You know, why might I want to give this a try? Um, and uh, that's been fantastic. It's been a learning experience for me, for sure. Uh, com coming from, you know, one cloud over to the other side, there's a lot of things that translate, a lot of things that don't. So I'm learning right along with everybody else and just trying to share what I learn in ways that, you know, are, are maybe a little bit less boring to listen to. I think that's a wonderful lesson to take away for anyone who's listening here and saying, okay, how do I connect with developers and get yep. them building in my ecosystem? Uh, you know, we just had Discord on in a recent episode where we talked about like, okay, they're trying to get more developers to develop you know, first party apps, which they now yep. open a first party app store. And I think to your point, one of the ways to connect with developers is not to just be too serious and to actually create media that speaks to them. And I'd love to hear from you what your perspective is on that, because I think that's a, a wonderful actual takeaway that uh, engineering leaders here can take not only to their own teams, but also to, you know, building these products for developers. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you brought up Discord. They're a big Google Cloud uh, user. Perfect. Uh, I'm yeah. here to help. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I, I, they had shared a blog recently where they were talking about some work they had done to kind of build uh, a, a data layer on top of Google Cloud's core storage primitives. Oh. Uh, and they did that. Um, while staying laser focused on what they actually needed to build for their customers. One of the things I really like about Discord uh, is that they don't get lost in kind of technology for technology's sake, you know, but they're they're so close to the the not the bare metal in terms of the hardware they're building on the cloud, but the bare metal in terms of what is actually going to deliver value for this extremely real time, yeah. extremely active global community that they have. And so when they need to do something wild like, you know, okay, let's let's like create our own uh sort of uh, amorphous storage platform that uses a little bit of uh, persistent disk and uses a little bit of cloud storage and all this, they're, they're finding a way to do that uh, without changing anything about their, their DNA of, of how they speak to customers. I think that's cool. That's what cloud should be. You know, not that we can't do cool things. We should do cool things, but they're doing cool things in the service of helping customers, not for its own sake. I, I think that's awesome. And, and we want to encourage and enable more of that. Absolutely. What are other lessons you're seeing either from customers or from within Google about where you see cloud going in the future? Oh yeah. I'm glad you asked that because we just had Google cloud next last week, which is Google's annual event to, to sort of ask those kind totally. of questions. Uh, and we had a developer keynote where we, I put out a bunch of those predictions, and um, I don't know if I agree with all of them. Some of them are kind oh, of intentionally perfect. controversial. All right. All right. Uh, one of them that I thought was interesting is they're they're saying uh, the the prevalence of of AI in industry is going to be such that we're going to see um, kind of a, an overall move across industries to a four day work week by the year 2025. I have talked to some folks uh, about that, and I think there are a lot of folks who feel that way. I, yeah, I so I don't know. I like this Google Cloud telling me I'm going to be able to come in four days a week by 2025. I, nice. I don't know. Yeah. That's what it sounds like to me. So I think we're going to have to hold them to 
do that. Uh, but it's, you know, that's maybe the the attention grabbing prediction, but the, sure. the underlying thing there is, I mean, look at the things that are being automated and managed now, you know, that, that were not even possible a few years ago. I was ago. just playing with a mid journey bot in discord actually. Yes, sure. Uh, like you can create incredible images now with just a little prompt, uh, videos are happening, uh, audio. There's so much happening that, five years ago, we couldn't even really, we, we knew it we might get there, but it was yes. not happening at that point. I, yeah. And you think about how early are we, how early on we are in this. I, I mean, if you want to compare it to like mobile, which I think of as the last revolution on yes, the scale that totally. AI is going to be like Dolly and mid journey and stable diffusion, and all these, it's almost like, it's like the, the fart apps of, of mobile, right? Like, you yeah. know, they, uh, people are using them, but it's, it's almost like a trivial use case for, for what could be happening, but it's demonstrating that the technology is there. Uh, it's ready to take off it. So, so fascinated to see what's going to happen there. But a, a, another area that I think would be interesting to, uh, this audience is uh, Google Cloud has been predicting that by the year 2025, four out of five enterprise developers, so people that are you know not just indie developers developing on their own, but they're in a large Working corporate at a Home context. Depot and Nike yeah, or something. wherever, right? Yeah. That they're going to be use, using some form of of what we're calling curated open source. Now that was a new term to me until pretty recently. And that's because um, Eric Brewer inside of Google Cloud likes to say that he just made it up. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, that's all, aren't all terms made up. So well, here we, we are again with that. But basically curated open source is the idea that uh, we love open source. We love building, you know, portably and we love having access to that. But at the same time, look at you know, log for shell and other things that happen. We've got these software supply chain dependencies that we need to make sure we secure. Right. And so it's probably a good idea to have some sort of intermediary layer where these packages are vetted and we're sure that the open source that we're installing is actually the open source that we think we're installing. We need right? security, even if it's in an open source product. Uh, yeah, we need, we need that security. We, we need to make sure not only that we're installing the package we think we're installing, um, but that we can see the provenance for that, see where it came from. And uh, so Google is doing this with something called Assured OSS. There's a bunch of packages in that uh, repository. Now it's like 250 plus Python and Java and other things like that. They'll, they'll continue to add to that over time. Um, and there's other partners and people in the ecosystem that are doing that. But the, the prediction is wherever you get your open source from, you're going to get it from somewhere that's got some you know layers of, of dependability and, and assurance baked into it. Uh, and so that's that's something that I'm watching. Um, as part of that, not to turn this into like a, a whole discussion of you know Google Cloud and what Google Cloud is building. I mean, building, I think folks but, are excited to hear what Google I, I think so, so. It. It, and I think Google's done a great job um, in this area of, of what the cool kids I think are now calling S3C, secure software supply chain is yep. the, the buzzword for that now. Uh, but it's it's this idea that uh, you want to look at your code from when it's on your laptop, so all the way as far left as you can get, all the way over to the right when it's running in production and everything that happens in between, so your build chain, your dependencies, all that kind of thing. Make sure that uh, you've got a really clear story for how you're protecting that software supply chain at, at each step along the way. Uh, and so Google announced something, Google Cloud announced something last week called Software Delivery Shield, which is not a product. It's not a new thing that they're requiring you to go and install and figure out, but it's really a set of capabilities being added to different Google Cloud build services that you may already be using. What are the capabilities that are being added? Yeah, so, and there's there's kind of different ones at each layer of that uh, journey from all the way on the left to the laptop, all the way to the right. The, the one I think I'm, I'm most excited about is the one on the left-hand side, which is uh, what they call cloud workstations. So that is a cloud IDE, a really core part of um, software delivery shield. And there's there's been cloud or hosted IDE products for a while now. I think it's part of a clear natural evolution in this industry from I think about 10 years ago, you know, we're all like shuffling bash scripts around on our machines, trying to create some kind of reproducible yeah. configuration, right? As we go from laptop to laptop, at some point we brought containers into the mix and now you're starting to see more and more of these, these hosted IDEs because the, the benefits are clear, right? The security benefit is clear. You can make sure you're enforcing and best compliance, practices. Yeah. Compliance benefits are clear. Uh, I, even just the benefit of being able to develop on cloud hardware, yeah. right? Instead of having to have this really tricked out laptop making sure that you're running your code in dev and it sort of performs the same way that's going to perform when it runs on cloud machines and prod. All those are really good things. But the, the downside has always been like the, the developer experience of this. I mean, is there going to be latency here? You know, what's, what's that going to look like for me? Am I going to have access to be able to configure what I want? Am I going to have the packages that I need? Some of these, these workstation environments have been limited that way. And, and I think cloud workstations is making great strides in that area. Obviously there's, there's always more to do, uh, but excited to see them roll that out. Excited to see them thinking about it with the security of the software supply chain in mind, right? Like, yeah. This is the the endpoint where devs are coding. We want to make sure that they have all the benefits of 
the, the secure software supply chain at that point in time. And then as you move on to, to more of the build phase, uh, that's where you're going to get access to uh, things like, I don't know if you've heard of what's called Salsa. Yep. Um, if you haven't seen that, you can check it out at, at Salsa. Dot, I think it's dot .dev, Salsa.dev, I think. It's SLSA. We, we say it's Salsa, we spell yeah. it SLSA. Uh, Dev. And, and this is a um, an initiative that Google has started to help create some levels to help us understand uh, what is the, the amount of maturity we have in, in our protection of our software supply chain. Uh, so they brought in these capabilities of what they call Salsa Level 3, I believe, uh, which is saying that not only are we going to make sure that we can um, uh, detect where our dependencies came from, but we're going to provide like software bills of materials around them uh, to make sure that they cannot be changed after the fact, right, that at the, the time that you brought them in. That's what they're going to be. And then as you move all the way into running your code on cloud infrastructure, uh, they've rolled out some really cool new logging and monitoring capabilities for services like Cloud Run, like GKE. So these are your container environments, your Kubernetes environments. Um, and just saying, hey, like, wouldn't you like to be able to, it's almost like spell check for your container security. You know? Convenient. Yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't you like to have best practices surface to you on yeah. securing your containers based on what Google thinks is the right thing to do and based on what you know our, our uh, most advanced customers are doing? Let's synthesize that and make that available to you as recommendations. And that's something uh, that machine learning can help identify as well. Absolutely, yeah. Huge opportunity. Right back to what we we're talking about. You're absolutely right. Uh, strong, strong components of that. Um, so you can go check out the developer keynote from Google Cloud Next. It's on YouTube and you can check out, I think there's 10, We'll nine try or to 10 link it in the show notes here too. Yeah, I think totally. that'd be fascinating. Yeah, I, and there's maybe like a short version of it that we can find too. But uh, a lot of them are, are AI or ML related. A lot yeah. of them are related to uh, the, the advancements in security. I think there's a prediction where it talks about 90% of security operations workflows becoming automated and managed as code, which really boils down to, hey, security analysts are going to have to think like developers now. Yeah. Not saying they're necessarily going to have to, you know, write a ton of code because ideally a lot of this is managed for you. You know, it's, it's not like you have to go create all this from scratch, but you're just thinking about managing managing these workflows, yeah. right? And, and having them committed to source control and being able to audit and, and configure them that way. I mean, when you talk to most AI or ML experts, what they'll tell you is like, we are trying to enable humans to do the problem solving piece that humans are really good at and yeah. automate away the rest and right. provide them information and context that AI is really good at identifying and saying, hey, we see this trend, you should take a look at it. And that's exactly what I think we're seeing in the security space. Um, but to your point uh, about developer experience, it's also changing the way we work and how we have to think about uh, how we're building our teams, how folks are working. Uh, what are you seeing as far as that major trend of like this ad adjusted developer experience in the cloud and also like as AI impacts different pieces of what Google's working on? Yeah, so I mean, the the more that we have the ability to automate uh, and take advantage of some of the, the technical innovations, the more we realize that our big problems were people problems all along. Right? Classic. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so one of the one of the things that I'm speaking about today uh, here at DevOps Enterprise Summit is uh, talking about the skills gap and talking about uh, I think Google Cloud has said we need something like 40 million new cloud builders in the industry by the end of this decade. Wow. AWS and others have put broadly similar ballpark numbers out there. Uh, those people are not just going to materialize out of thin air and they're not all going to come out of traditional what we might call golden paths like, you know, they got a four year computer science degree at a college right. or university somewhere. Interned at IBM right. and now I'm working somewhere else. Kind yeah, of we're, yeah, so we're going to need a whole lot of people to help us uh, get over this next round of digital transformation well, to use all these services. Colleges can't even right? keep up with that demand. They I, already can't keep up they, with the they demand. Can't, for right, and, and it's not that great people don't come out of the university system. Of course they do. I, I was a new grad myself once, right? Those people need jobs yeah. too. But we're going to have to think bigger and we're going to have to look in less conventional places. Uh, so um, I run an initiative on the side, not through Google, called the Cloud Resume Challenge. I've done this for a couple okay. of Okay. years now, the Cloud Resume Challenge. This is something that I started early on in the pandemic, and it's a community initiative that started as a way to help non-traditional people, so career changers, people without a degree in an IT-related field, but that want to get into tech as engineers, help them feel like they have the confidence to do that and go into interviews with something on their resume, a project on their resume. There's all sorts of nonprofits and boot camps and placement programs. That, so is it all about teaching this, them to Google what to do? Because like it, it realistically, all, yeah, that's a big component. It actually is. That's a, that's a great uh, question. So I, it, what it does not do is, you know, put you through a video course or uh, it does want you to get a certification, but it's not all about getting certified on, on a cloud provider or something like that. I, but it's about trying to teach you to learn like an engineer. Love so it. think about the way engineers learn. Uh, what do we do? We sit down, we read the docs. 
Uh, we maybe go through like a Hello World tutorial. Then we try to build something real. We get stuck. We go back and read the docs again. We try to build again. If we're maybe still stuck, find a YouTube video. Maybe yeah. find a YouTube video, or or maybe we go ask a friend. We go ask a colleague, totally. somebody sitting next to us. Right? Hey, can you sit down with me for five minutes? I can't figure this out. Uh, and, and then we go back and and, and uh, eventually we iterate to a point where we're able to ship something. So we build earlier, we build faster, and we're really focused on the primary sources, the the primary documentation. Yeah. We might have fifty Google tabs open, but but we'll get there. Uh, so it was the the goal was to design a project like that. How do you make that kind of learning experience accessible to people who have never done any kind of, of technology before? Uh, so very self-directed. And, and what I came up with is a technical spec. The Cloud Resume Challenge is a technical spec that asks you to build a personal website and put it in the cloud. But there's very specific things you have to hit along the way. You have to uh, put that... Uh, website in a cloud storage bucket. You have to have some source control behind the scenes. You've got to have a little CI CD pipeline involved there. This. There's infrastructure as code in the mix. You're actually going to end up building a little serverless API. So you've got to think about networking and authentication. If you can actually do this, and it's not easy, a lot of people flame out when they try this. But if you can get through all 16 steps of the Cloud Resume Challenge, you have done things not only that a lot of people graduating from university computer science programs haven't done, a lot of professional cloud engineers haven't done yeah. this either. And for that reason, over the two and a half years of this program, Program, we constantly, every day we have uh, people with two, three, five years of experience who say, I've actually never done all these things end to end. I would like to sit down and do this project. I feel like I need to go do it now because I, I guarantee there's multiple steps that I totally have not approached. Cloud resume challenge .dev. We would love to have you. You can do the project on AWS, on Azure, or on Google Cloud. So it's fully uh, cloud neutral. You can kind of pick the path that best makes sense for your career. But Forrest recommends yeah. Google Cloud, to I, be clear. I, the Google Cloud, yeah, the Google Cloud version is like highlighted because I yeah. work there. So I, you know, <laughs> after that. No, but it's, you know, it's uh, you, you do what what is going to make the most sense for you. Um, and so I, I put this out there in like April of 2020. Yeah. And the initial goal was, hey, maybe one or two people will find this helpful uh, because it's hard. You know, it's and it, you just like tweet it out. Like just what tweet you it do? out. Yeah, I went it on my newsletter. Um, and then lo and behold, you fast forward a few months uh, and we're finding people doing this uh, from backgrounds as diverse as uh, people from HR, people from you know, like they were bank tellers, uh, loggers, plumbers, professional wow. poker players. You know, it just wait, professional kind of, poker. Players. Yes, we've had a professional poker player okay. do this challenge on his way to transition to a career Good as a cloud them. engineer, yeah. which is super cool. And every one of those people, you know, it's not just about whatever technical skills they're picking up through this challenge, because they are picking up some. Uh, but like realistically, at the end of this, they're still very green, very junior. They're going to need a lot of support. Uh, but what they do bring to the table is remarkable real world op skills in a lot of places. Later today in my talk, it does, I'll be telling the story of Daniel Singletary, who was a commercial and residential plumber who transitioned to a DevOps role uh, in part through this challenge. And uh, the things that he was able to do, the things he was able to show in an interview, a lot of them weren't specifically related to what he learned in the project. They were related to, hey, look how he could break down a giant plumbing problem. Like this entire building is giving off a weird smell, yeah. you know, and break that down very systematically, uh, not get stymied by that problem, but work with a colleague to like test plumbing fittings one by one. Here's how we should approach it. Here's how we Let's should approach test. it, right? Let's iterate. Yeah, he has, you know, tracing techniques he's using to, to uh, chase a problem to its source. He has a great grasp of business continuity. He understands understands totally. that you can't just shut off these working businesses while you troubleshoot their plumbing, right? All of those things are real world skills that you kind of have to be out in the world to, to learn. And, and that's what these people have. And when you add technical skills to that, you have a really great base to do whatever you want. All of a sudden, you have a, a skill stack that really, in my opinion, helps you stand out. So there absolutely should be a place in the industry for this for these people, even if we didn't have this massive need for like 40 million new cloud builders, right? Yeah. And yet, and yet, Connor, Unfortunately, while we have many, many success stories over the last two and a half years of, of these people transitioning careers, before that happens, they often go through a months long process of frustration and interview pain where they'll come to me and say, well, I'm hearing, you know, oh, you don't qualify for these new grad programs. You don't have the three years all, of yeah, experience, all of our whatever. All of our scaffolding at our company is designed to onboard people that have this set of qualifications or, and this is much worse in my opinion, they will hear cloud isn't an entry level job. Interesting. If okay. you want to do DevOps, go get some experience with older forms of IT first. You can hear this. Uh, go do the stuff that doesn't work as well. And yeah, good. Go, go, right. You know, work your way up to, to cloud. You can wow. find this advice all over Reddit every day. I hear your frustration right now. Very frustrated when I hear that because, I mean, the whole point of this movement, of, of the DevOps movement that we're, we're sitting in this fishbowl in the middle of it right now, uh, yeah, the, the abstraction and toolification and cloudification, you're telling me after a decade plus of that, we can't onboard people. We still can't onboard people into this industry without requiring them to recapitulate the entire history of IT on their resumes. Oh, no. You know, shame on us, right? Yeah. What a sobering indictment of our industry. 
instead we like to talk about the skills gap, which we already brought up. And yeah. I think maybe subconsciously or not, we like to talk about the skills gap because it puts the blame on the people. Mm-hmm. We say, oh, I'd love to hire them. I'd love to have more but they juniors the skills. on my team. They, they don't, need to level they don't up. have yeah. the skills. They need to level up. Believe me, they're trying to get skills. They're crunching the cloud resume challenge and they're going to boot camps and they're getting certifications. They're jumping through more hoops than I ever jumped through to get into this industry as a computer science graduate. But we come back to them and we say, I'm sorry, none of what you did counts. Hmm. Your real skills come from work experience. And you see how these people are so frustrated. So it's not a skills gap, Connor. It's an experience gap. And when I we, mean, we talk a lot about that, a lot about, right, where you have a resume where it says, hey, I need three years of experience for this role, and someone has yeah. two, and they just are sifted out immediately. Right. So, so when you put it that way, you frame it as an experience gap, then you see what the real problem is, because who can give them experience? Organizations, only, companies. Only we can do that. Yeah. Right? So we are the ones who are not building the bridge. We are failing them. Okay. This is a real sobering indictment, as you it, said. Like, it, this is yeah. something where I think folks listening may feel this a bit and say, oh, like, are we taking the right approach? I get exercised about this, as you can tell. Other yeah. industries don't necessarily have exactly this problem. I mean, you, you wonder how Daniel, the plumber that I mentioned, wonder how he became a plumber. You know, he didn't go buy somebody's plumbing video course. Get an apprenticeship. He got an apprenticeship, absolutely. Yeah. He So he worked, you know, uh, through his plumbing board for a variety of different plumbers, wasn't always the same person, but he went out on real jobs with them, got paid to do it, wasn't much, but he did get paid. And at the end of that time, uh, you know, he had the experience necessary to go get qualified as a journeyman and, and start out on his own. I. Uh, I'm not trying to romanticize the trades. They have all sorts of systemic issues of their own, but they do seem to grasp for the most part that if you're going to put people in charge of critical infrastructure, they are going to need a seasoning period. And cloud is critical infrastructure. Let's not forget that. We're at that point. They are going to need a seasoning period alongside experienced professionals doing real stuff. And there has to be some sort of system in place to facilitate that. So I think some folks, I'm going to play a bit of a challenge here. I feel like people would challenge you and say, Hey, well, you know, DevOps is changing so fast. Cloud is changing so fast. We, we can't build a program like that. It's going to be out of date in two years. What do you say to those folks? It's, it's less about the specific skills or the specific technologies. Don't focus it's on the that. problem solving. It's, it's about the problem solving. Yeah. So how do you identify people that have the aptitude, that have the motivation to succeed in this field? And it turns out the Cloud Resume Challenge is a, has been uncannily effective at surfacing those kind of people because it tends to self-select for people who have the patience to sit down and go through 50 They went to go tests, do this right? thing voluntarily. Yes, yeah. yeah. So it's a little bit of a trial by fire in that respect because part of the goal of it too, it's not like it's mean or adversarial. Part of the goal is if you try it and you don't like it, that's actually really good to know because these are the kind of problems that yeah. real cloud engineers actually work on in their daily work. So they, you know, don't don't uh, knock yourself out trying to do something that you're not going to enjoy uh, or that you, that you can't live with. Uh, so... <laughs> After all of that, you know, what is it that will enable us to bring more of these non-traditional career changers into these companies? Because we can have all the boot camps and nonprofits and placement programs of varying degrees of predatoriness that that we want on the what I would call the supply side. But none of it works unless we meet them halfway on the demand side. I mean, as I look at the companies that have been successful onboarding these what I call cloud resume champions, people who've Mm -hmm. concluded this. Do you mind uh, naming some of those companies? I well, I can't name too many of them on on this call because some of them are also Google Cloud customers and I don't want to like be weird about that. So I I won't name companies that I don't have permission to name. But uh, you know, some of them do tend to be much larger, like Fortune 500 size, because they tend to have more infrastructure infrastructure. to do what I'm about to describe, which is you've got to set expectations. um, And you can kind of do this bottom up, like it can be an individual team that starts with this, you don't have to set this Company wide, yeah, company wide to, to start thing, with, yeah. you, you, not necessarily. You probably need like an executive sponsor at the VP level sure. or something like that. But what you're really going to have to do is get buy in from your senior engineers, because those people are the ones whose time and effort is going to be taken up having like an apprentice sitting alongside mentoring, them. mentoring them. It's because it's it's not just mentoring like, hey, I'm going to have a lunch and learn with you once a, a week or, or sit down with you once a month. It's legitimate daily pair programming. This apprentice is n- not in any position to be doing mission critical work yet, right? They are going to need to sit beside you, watch what you do, ask questions, take a little piece of a task you hand off to them, bring it back in, get code review and peer feedback on it, and then start over again. All right, this is actually what I did when I when I started my career. And I did come out of a, a computer science program, but I was a SQL Server DBA at a giant enterprise called Infor, and I sat next to a senior DBA for like the first three or four months of that job. Uh, this was back when we still actually had offices. So we were yeah. in an actual office together and uh, you know, he would hand me off pieces of tasks to do. I would watch what he did. Um, and that's how I gained the confidence to, to start doing more things on my own. Uh, but that takes so much buy-in from your seniors to do that. Cause they may not think that's what they got hired to do. 
you know, uh, yeah. so it, it, it will not work unless they're committed to doing that and unless you're committed to incentivizing and rewarding them for that mentality and that behavior. So let's right? say I'm someone listening and I'm a VP of engineering at like yeah. a, a mid-sized company and, and I'm hearing what you're saying, it's resonating and I, and I want to build a program like this. Yeah. What are the steps that you would suggest taking? Because I hear incentivization, I hear getting buy-in from senior engineering leaders. Like yeah. what's, what's kind of the one, two, three, four, five of like, how do you start this program and, and try it out? Yeah. So it's, to be clear, the Cloud Resume Challenge is, is not a uh, batteries included program to building an apprentice program at yeah. your, at your uh, company. I, there are other places that do that. You can look up places like Apprenti and, and uh, others that have more guidance on, um, uh, you know, how you build a functioning apprenticeship program. But bottom line, for me, it comes down to uh, having intentionality within your part of the organization uh, that you're going to, you know, fight for and reserve headcount for uh, apprentice type engineering, because that's how you talk. We were talking about the software supply chain before. This is a de-risk for your software supply chain because it starts with developers, right? You're not always going to be mm. able to go out and compete on the open market, you know, unless you're like literally Someone's going to pay yeah. more money. Someone's you're you're gonna not going to be able perks. to compete on the open market for that tiny pool of experienced talent that's floating around at any given time. So the to sustainably grow your company and be able to build the way you want to build in your culture, you're going to need to bring in people uh, that come from non-traditional backgrounds that are earlier in their careers that are willing to uh, be loyal to you, learn you know, to do things your way. And that have unique skill advantages that you can And that have use. unique skill advantages, right. These are not people that don't have anything to bring to the table. They just need the technical uh, seasoning. So you're going to have to to set an expectation that that type of uh, headcount is required. Then you're going to need to set expectations with your seniors. Uh, identify probably, a, you know, a subset of people that are willing to participate in this. Yes, I'm willing to have someone sit beside me and I feel within me an intrinsic motivation to give back. And then you need to set, uh, you know, like I said, incentives and rewards for those people so that, hey, this is going to be a promotion path for you. This is going to be something yeah. that we value, that we bring up when you come up for your, your promo packet comes up for review. Uh, it's not just about how much code you personally shipped or that design you did, but look, you grew an engineer. That's the coolest thing, right? You know, that's your path to principle. You want to talk that's about your doubling your productivity. Great. You just grew a, a yes, baby engineer. Be becoming so. a 10X engineer is finding nine other 1X engineers. Yeah, I love right? it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and then your next step is like a hiring manager or a senior engineering leader is how do you identify what my friend Joe Emerson, who does a great job of this, by the way, at his startup, how do you identify what he calls undervalued people? So those are people with great potential in a dev role or an ops role, but they don't have the traditional credentials. So they may be uh, getting, you know, missed by the filters of, of people that are not thinking about this. How do you identify those people? The cloud resume challenge has proven very effective at doing that. There's other ways to do it as well. And then uh, how do you onboard, bring them on, and then give them uh, clear paths to thrive as they develop over that period of time? What does the end point, the end game look like for them? They're not just being kind of left to twist in the wind in this organization with you know, no ability to uh, advance or to, to grow their skills. You don't want them to feel like they're just lost and confused. That's a part of the team. Yeah, they have to be part of the team. They have to be valued. They have to know their role. The team has to know their role, not have different expectations for them than they're capable of providing, right? Uh, and this absolutely can be done. I used to be a mentor. Uh, at some point, I rose at Infor to be a point where I could mentor what we called green beans. And some of those people did come in from non-traditional backgrounds. Um, and we had great success with them. Some of those people are still my friends, colleagues, you know, today have gone on to do amazing things. This absolutely can be done. A lot of companies are doing it. We can all do better. Uh, but here's the bottom line, Connor. Every one of us, here in this industry, you, me, anybody, we're here because somebody at some point took a chance. Somebody yeah. looked at you when you had no experience and said, that person has the aptitude, they have the motivation, and I believe I can teach them the rest. So how are you paying that forward? Not you, you, us, you, right? How are you paying here. that forward? Yeah, yeah as, absolutely. A, as a senior engineer, who are you giving your time and credibility to? As a hiring manager, how are you identifying those undervalued people? As a any kind of a leader, how are you setting expectations up and down your organization that healthy teams include non-traditional learners, career changers, help them to thrive, help them to grow into the people who can help you build your future? Uh, it's not easy. Change never is. But we have to do it. We have to get there. I think that's a really wonderful note for us to uh, end on here. And it's a great call to action to the industry to really challenge folks to step up. Because to your point, like, we are competing for a smaller pool of talent than we were five years ago. Uh, and there's growing needs within cloud for every company. Any company that is even approaching cloud needs more engineers, needs more DevOps roles. Uh, so this, this is a great initiative, and, I, and I'm really glad you're going to be speaking at, at it to speaking to at, about it at Does, and also that you're speaking about it here on the podcast. Uh, we're really excited to have you on. And uh, Forrest, uh, it's been a fascinating conversation. Uh, thanks very much for coming on. Of course. Thanks, Connor. Anytime. And I will give a last call to action for anyone here who's still listening. Brazil. Uh, yeah. We do love it 
absolutely love it when you review our podcast on Apple Podcasts because it helps us a ton and helps us grow the credibility of the show. It shows other people that you care uh, and it helps the algorithm. So if you haven't done it yet, give us a review on Apple Podcasts. It means the world to me. Just shoot me an email. I'll get you a DevOps t-shirt if you want to do it. Uh, and thanks so much for listening.